sometimes instead of a full text, provide an outline. JFK, when he was speaking several times a day during the campaign, said, just as a security blanket, he wanted to have a piece of paper in front of him. Even if he didn't read every word, he wanted to have it there that he could refer to. And whether that was notes or an outline or whatever. It got to a point where the, uh, some of the press corps traveling with us found that the speech that was handed out so they could have something to file through their newspapers every day uh, wasn't the speech that he actually used and uh, threatened to refer to him as a text of deviant <laughs> until uh, Press Secretary Salinger uh, uh, assured them that they could file uh, what was handed out whether the president uh, said every word of it or not. Instead of notes or an outline, uh, some speakers and speech writers can be of help on this, uh, employ what I, if I could get the word right, uh, is a mnemonic, which is a device for remembering the key points of the speech by remembering the key words of the speech and and the mnemonic is using the first letter of those key words. Those of you who uh, have been, I hope most of you, who have been paying close attention uh, this morning uh, know that of necessity, because I cannot read the text or even an outline or notes, I use a And um, you can figure out what it was. I said the key word is fabulous. I said that uh, Obama's inaugural fell short of some uh, expectations. I said that uh, a few words, a few lines are all it takes to write a speech. Uh, I think I had a few others, but I've already forgotten my mind. <laughs> One which I uh, must mention uh, on this occasion is, uh, is a, uh, for speakers, if not speech writers, and we're sometimes but not always the same, is the question of uh, fees. You would be amazed once you get out on the circuit on your own, I'm sure many of you are, how many uh, institutions, whether we're talking about universities or civic clubs or business lunches or whatever uh, say, oh no, well, we don't pay an honorarium to our speakers. And I say to them, uh, is there food being served in this room? <laughs> do you pay the people who provide the food? Oh, yes. Do you pay the people who uh, take care of the electricity and the plumbing? Oh yes. And so on until finally I say, in other words, it's, it's only the people who come and provide ideas and intellectual content that you refuse to pay. I said, well, you've got a good point. <laughs> but they defend themselves on grounds that they uh, believe in free speech. <laughs> and too often I give them one. <laughs> but I talked about sidelines quotations. On that campaign trail in 1960, the boys on the bus, the press corps following us to every stop, soon grew weary of hearing about Colonel Davenport. I'm sure, there's, I can't see this audience, but I'm sure there's no one here old enough to have been on that bus, but if they are, they will remember the story with which JFK closed almost every informal campaign speech. He and I at the time thought it came from a book by Alastair Cook, a famous British book, spoken in America. And then I discovered later that it came from a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier. Whatever the source, it seems that in the 18th century, through some meteorological 
aberration. In Hartford, Connecticut, the skies at noon turned dark. And in the old colonial assembly, it grew so dark in the chamber that members were crying out in terror and alarm. And the Speaker of the House, Colonel Davenport, gaveled for attention and he said, gentlemen, there were no women in the old colonialism in Connecticut, gentlemen, there is no cause for alarm. If the day of either the day of judgment is here or it is not, if it is not, there is no cause for panic. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty, and I ask, therefore, that candles be brought. <coughs> Speechwriters of America, whether in the public sector or the private, at the national level or the local, all of you are bringing candles to light our nation's way. And for that, I salute you. And